So my name is Siobhan Thomas and I am not English. Uh, I moved to London 17 years ago. I am from Canada, so I'm also not American, even though I might sound American. Um, and I work at a place called London South Bank University and I run the game design and development program there. And what I wanted to talk to you about today is a project that's been running for about five years and it comes from a background of wanting to embed accessibility into the game design and development course since when I started this job, which was about nine years ago. And when I started the job, I had previously been working on an intellectual disability project, basically looking at how to uh, get web, develop web developers to consider uh, intellectual disability when they were making web designs. Now, this was, my, this was my mission, and I arrived at university all gung-ho to embed accessibility into the curriculum, and if you can imagine that embedding accessibility into a single games project is difficult, embedding accessibility into a course with 90 students over three years and multiple types of game projects of multiple levels of difficulty, whether they're 2D game designs, 3D level designs, or large-scale final year projects, is quite tricky, actually. So the main thing I started to focus on was getting my students to meet game developers, industry people, and every year we would uh, go to Eurogamer Expo, and my students would volunteer for you know, Ubisoft or Bethesda. And this is where the story starts. I'm in a meeting at Bethesda with two guys. One is called um, David Lilly. He kind of heads up uh, events at Eurogamer. I've probably got his title completely wrong, so David Lilly, I'm sorry, I've got your title wrong and a guy named Gareth Swan, who at the time was a European event manager for Bethesda. And David Lilly said to me, hey, we have this other organization that has some technology, and they want you to make your students to make some games for them. And I thought, okay, that sounds really cool. And so that's, the reason I mentioned this project in this way is because this is where I think a lot of very, very exciting things happen. At these moments which you don't anticipate, which are kind of, Synchronistic, synchronistic, synchronicity, and this is this is the start of this project, Enable Gaming, which has run for five years and has had a profound, life-changing effect on me, not just everybody else involved in the project. So, I'll go back to slide. Yeah, talked about that. Um, so, Enable Gaming is a partnership right now between London South Bank University and an organization called Life Lights. I'll talk about Life Lights in a second. London South Bank University is uh, a polit it came out of the, the, if you know anything about the UK kind of academic structure or university structure, it came out of a polytechnic base. And it was established in 1892. And its focus is on innovation and entrepreneurship. And just two months ago, I can't remember, we won the Times Higher Education Award for entrepreneurship which is quite cool for a university that, you know, usually these things are won by um, Cambridge, Oxford, you know, universities like that. So it was quite nice to have London South Bank University on the map for that. And as you can see, it's right in the heart of central London. And what happens in the heart of central London is this little game design and development course, which is a BA slash BSc. So you do programming and art and it's a general design course. It runs for three years versus the US system and Canadian system, which is four years long. And I have about 90 students, and it grows a little bit every year because the university forces me to take more students. But I'm always like, no, 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 no more students. Um, the other thing about the program is that only industry experts teach on it. So this was one of my criteria, that the course is taught by people working in industry who have released titles in a number of different in a number of different ways. Um, the guy who teaches programming has released hundreds of AAA titles. The other thing is that there's a focus on networking. So we run an industry event called Game Camp. Um, if you're ever in the UK and you're gonna happen, if you happen to be in the UK on May 6th this year, come to Game Camp. It's the most fun games event, aside from you know GEC and um, GA Conf, or how you, I don't know how to officially say the title of this conference. <laughs> Um, I also run IGDA London, and so we have a lot of IGDA London events at London South Bank University because I can get a space there, and it's awesome. We just had a nice PlayStation VR event, and we're having a writing event in the new year um, called Reads Like a Seven, so if you're in London, make sure you join IGDA London on Facebook, and you can find out when the events are happening. 
And then we have a lot of game jams, because I think one of the things when you run a game design course is you have space to have these things, and that's kind of what I think my mission is, to sort of provide opportunities for people to get together and chat and do development work. But one of the things I think you need to know about the course, and the reason I'm mentioning all this stuff about the background of the course, is kind of my epistemological orientation, I guess, to put it in academic terms, um, but it's that I believe in body-oriented game design and my doctorate is in sensory game design and sensory methodologies for game design. So I sort of force all of my students to adhere to this body-oriented methodology. And this body-oriented methodology it, it spans into teaching as well. So for instance, I pay attention to things like the temperature of the classroom and alter it from being hot to cold depending on how I want students to feel at a particular time. We also have a lot of discussions about game feel and hardware inputs and how does this button feel versus this other button and why have you designed this game mechanic and what is the feeling behind the game mechanic. But also there's this idea of inclusiveness which spans across the whole entire course. So it's three years long and if whatever year you're in you can go to any, any lecture, any discussion or any crit or any um, specialist seminar that's happening, uh, whether it's year three and you're in year one or year two and you're you know, wanting to help your ones. So there's a lot of peer learning, there's a lot of shared knowledge, and it's this idea of open access that permeates everything. The other thing is this idea of learning by doing. Uh, this is a very unfamiliar thing for me to be doing, which is telling people about something. Uh, I much prefer when people are actually enacting, enacting knowledge. So that's kind of where this, that's where this project started to sit. So I mentioned that we partner with an organization called Life Lights. And when I was in that meeting with David Lilly and Gareth Swan, and I should mention that Gareth Swan now runs um, Gamer Disco as well as his own consultancy, he doesn't work at Bethesda anymore, um, was I didn't know what the organization was, I just said, yeah, okay, I'll do it because it sounded interesting. Then it turned out it was something to do with accessibility, and then it turned out that it was to make games for a company that provides technology for 54 children's hospices in the UK. So that's about 10,000 children who are in um, hospices. The woman who runs Life Lights right now, the managing director, is someone named Simone Ennefer Doy. I can't pronounce her last name either. Um, but she is incredibly, incredibly gracious, um, generous with her time, and we couldn't have this project without them. So that's just something to keep in mind when you want to develop a project like this is that you need a solid industry, or non-industry in this case, partner, who's willing to invest some time into, into the partnership. But why does the project actually work? Well, Life Lights is not a games company, but Life Lights needs games made for them because they have all this technology. So the project works because first and foremost, students have the opportunity to work with a professional client on a real life brief. They're given a brief that they have to achieve. They're also under pressure to create quality games because it's for a client, it's not just for me. And I say, oh, I don't like that. But it's for the client who's going to say, no, that doesn't work for, for us or our needs. And the final thing and the most important thing is that it has actual real life consequences. So this is a big thing. You know, when you make a game and you release it, you have a feeling about what that game might mean in the world. But for this project, when you make a game, it really, really means something in the world of the people who play it. Uh, and it makes, has a profound impact on their life. And I've used that word profound quite a bit, but I, I don't know how else to express it, because that is kind of what, what happens. So I'm going to tell you what the current process for the project is, because I think anybody can do this. And I would encourage you, if you have a game development company, to get in people who have impairments and disabilities in-house to work with you. That's kind of, or at the very least, to employ them to do small-scale contract work. It's a very small thing that you can do for the accessibility community. Well, that's really small, sorry. Um, so the first thing is, the whole project is organized around um, studio development processes. I, run, I Each year there's four or five projects and I sort of sit as a creative director, lead producer, and then there's teams of students making accessible projects. At their base, all the projects have to be 
one button input. There can be lots of other modes, and you know we use lots of other inputs like EEG and eye tracking and all that sort of stuff. But at their heart, they have to be with one button input. And they follow industry processes. We have stand-ups, we do debriefs. And the other important thing is when you have any kind of games project for students is I can't, I can't do everything myself. I can direct things, but I can't program. I mean, I can program, but not in the way that uh, you need to be able to program to give students help. So I have a team of industry experts who assist with that. The other thing about running a project like this, um, and if you're in a game development studio, you probably already hopefully have all those studio development processes all sorted out. Uh, is that you need to start from a core accessibility knowledge base. So all team members need to get together to understand what basic accessibility you're trying to achieve. And the best way to do that is to have this a really cool person come in and do an accessibility lecture because people will dedicate you know, an hour or 40 minutes to listening to that. And we were really lucky because there's a guy named Ian Hamilton, who I think you might know, who um, happens, <laughs> happened to be in London at that point in time and graciously decided or agreed to uh, come and do an accessibility lecture. So that's one hand. And the, the other hand is that we rely on things like game accessibility guidelines to be the marking criteria for accessibility throughout the program. So the other thing you should know is that once we started doing this, and this was a final, for final year projects, is then accessibility become embedded throughout the three years of the course. So now students, whether they're doing year one projects, year two projects, or year three projects, need to meet minimum accessibility requirements. So I guess what I'm saying is if I can do this in a university setting, I think you can do this. Um, I, I think I'm speaking to the converted here, but I don't think there's any obstacle to somebody achieving this in their company, at least in a very small way. The other part of the process is that there is a client-facing element. So students aren't just doing university coursework. They're having to go outside and achieve for a client based on what a client says. The other thing, and I'll talk more about this um, during the rest of the presentation, is that we have user testers embedded weekly coming in to test the game. So they're in situ within the development process. And I think this is the most important thing that you can do, is to find people who will commit time to come and be with you while you're doing development. You can't ignore accessibility if someone is sitting there looking at you and trying to do things. The other thing, as you might imagine, for hospice project is we go and visit the hospice. Now that has all sorts of um, difficulties because obviously you, you can't just rock up at hospice anytime you want and um, there's some sensitivities with working with hospices, which I'll talk about in a sec. And then the other thing is some sort of burst. So a coalescence of time where you, know, you might be working on your project every single day of the week, but to have a dedicated time where you have nothing else that gets in the way. So to kind of leave time to do that, either a jam um, off-site or in our case, on-site at LSBU. So I'm going to go back in time. So I mentioned this was a five-year project. I'm going to start at year one and year two. I was pretty excited in year one. I thought, yes, I'm really excited about this project. Yes, I'll make it happen. I say yes a lot to people and worry about how I'm going to fit it into things later. And then kind of realize, well, I have this year three project, which right now it was all microcontrollers and making um, different types of hardware inputs uh, for game development projects. I thought, okay, well, I'll just add in accessibility here and we'll start making games for, for the hospices. And I'm going to make this project, which was called Tangible Play before, mostly focused on physical, physical computing. I changed it to be this brief-led project where students still had to deliver their hardware um, input and make their own bespoke hardware input, but now they had to meet the client brief as well. So this is the other thing that happens in the course that I, I just keep adding things to modules <laughs> because it just gets harder and harder every year. Um, and in year one and year two, so they delivered their, they delivered their um, unique controllers. They went to, what they went to Life Lights. Life Lights came to LSBU and gave feedback. We had an external facing jam and then we went to the hospice. So that was kind of the first two years of the project. And when I look back and think, oh, what did we do in the first two years? It doesn't seem like we did very much. And then I reflected, well, it, in its entirety, in those first two years, was only two, um, 24 weeks long, because it was only in, the, in each semester. So when students go to Life Lights, it's very important that it's a very formal thing. They have an appointment that they have to go when they go on their teams and they meet Simone, 
and she talks through the history of life light, she, sh she shows them technology, and then she underscores the geographic kind of expanse that the project covers. It's, as I mentioned before, 54 hospices, 10,000 10, kids that they provide technology for. So this is kind of the user group that we have to um, make the games for. And the cool thing about the hospice, I mean, this is, um, this is an older photo. It's from the first two years of the project. But this was the first time that FAR had ever used eye tracking. And it was the first time you know, um, a lot of students had ever used eye tracking. And then just being in this environment and trying this out and seeing, oh, actually, it's really, really tricky to try and use eye tracking if you don't use it on a daily basis. In that same first year of the project, we also had, um, uh, did an accessibility jam at, at the Virgin Media space. And I think this is quite an interesting thing to do if you're doing development work, especially accessible development work, is to get out and do some sort of jam externally so that people can see what you're doing and that you can gain publicity for it. Um, it sort of piggybacks what Tara was saying earlier about being, getting people to be evangelical about the work that you're doing. So we had a newspaper article written. Um, Ian was there again. Ian is lovely and just dedicates his time to helping people out. So he was really good to have on site um, to give accessibility feedback. So that was in. So that's the visit to to Life Lights. That's the external game jam. And I just wanted to talk a bit about going to hospice. Um, obviously, going to a children's hospice is incredibly tricky. Um, it's time consuming to organize, it's time consuming to get there. You can't be sick, you can't have a cold. Um, and access to the hospice is through this organization, Life Lights. So I don't think we could run this project in the same way if Life Lights didn't exist. So the students go in small groups, and there's usually a small number of children in the hospice. And you're never sure how many children are going to be in the hospice, actually, because it's quite a fluid situation. And like with any other te user testing, but even more so because you get one sort of chance at doing this, you have to make sure you're organized. You have all your forms with questions printed out. You have clipboards. You have your audio recording devices. And you've made sure that all your forms and consent forms um, and uh, parental consent forms have been, have been covered off before you even arrive at the hospice. And the reason I'm just mentioning this is just a flag that when you're doing user testing, there's all this structural process stuff, which Hannah alluded to for the BBC projects as well, that you have to consider. It's not just that you do accessible user testing, it's not just you, you do accessible test uh, development, but you have to have some sort, sort of structural basis for it as well. I think it's super important if you're going off-site, and especially doing work with kids, that you should have multiple devices. So bring the game on your laptop, bring the game on your uh, uh, well, you probably wouldn't put it on your iPhone, but you could put it on an um, Android device. And you have different types of input mechanisms as well. So you bring switches, you bring, um, we always bring makey makeys because you can attach, I don't know if you know what makey makeys is, it's just a really quick thing that you can create an electrical circuit to, and anything that conducts electricity, then you can make into a controller. So you can make a banana controller, I mean, that's the easy example that they always use. So then basically anything can become a switch input, no matter where you are, so you don't have to spend a lot of money on switches. The thing to keep in mind about switches is that there's a slight delay. So each switch is slightly different about how it interacts with, as an input mechanism. And sometimes if it's a long, there can be a slight delay if you're combining switches with um, keyboard input devices. And the other thing to um, just flag is that eye tracking takes a long time to calibrate sometimes. So. So this was our, our first user testing at the hospice. And I think there were three children there at that point in time. And the reason I'm putting, I just wanted to give you a sense of the environment because the, in, in the hospices, they have a technology room, but then you can also put technology in the children's room when they're in, in their actual hospice beds. And it was really important that we brought um, mobile devices because you can sort of see this is how one's child, uh, one, child interacted with the phone, and you can see hand position and sort of the challenges that that child might have with hand position, but then you can also sort of see the challenges that this child had with hand position. So using, it's quite good to bring a device because you can see how people are physically interacting with your game, especially if it's a mobile game. And then we just had prototypes and easy switch. You know, once, once you have 
uh, Arduino or you have Makey Makey, you can just make any kind of switch you want. There, you can, uh, it's the easiest kind of input mechanism to make, and it doesn't have to be glamorous. So in this case, it wasn't glamorous, but it sort of did the job. It just rested his hand on it. And it, um, it fit with sort of the, the game input because it was uh, just an adventure exploration game at that time. On the previous slide, I had the word celebration noted. And I think this is really important in game design in general. And I think we often forget to do this, which is basically anytime something happens, whether it's you, you nail a jump mechanism or something good has happened, you should take a moment to celebrate that success. In the case of uh, uh, user testing with someone who's intellectual disabilities or children, you definitely need to celebrate that success. And sometimes you celebrate it in really seemingly cheesy ways, but it's really, really important. So I think this is something, something to consider when you have um, children user testers, people with intellectual disabilities, or just sometimes people in general. They just want some sort of certification that they've completed this thing that they've done, done for you. The other thing is, in the case of a uh, hospice situation, it's really important that the children's names go if they want to be recognized in the credits of the game. And things like leaderboards take on a different dimension, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with people who have life-threatening diseases. So that was kind of what happened in year one and year two. After trying to set things up in a hospice for a while, we realized it doesn't work that well. I mean, you can go to the hospice, and we do go to the hospice every year. But you also need to do other types of user testing, because if you only use your test once with your target audience, then it doesn't really produce um, the best games at the end of the process. So we had one in-house user testing session in the third year. So now we're on to year three. Um, and this was the person who did uh, the user testing, and I'm going to play a video. So the first thing that we would do anytime um, we worked with user testers would do so some sort of benchmark to see sort of the capabilities of the user. And in this case, you know, he couldn't move his head, he could have minimal hand, mo hand movement. So just contrast that with another user. So I'm talking to him about what he, uh, what he already has that he can use for input, game input. Alright, then how about this one? So you usually use your joystick in your right hand. Alright. But so you don't usually use buttons for your right hand. They feel really, really different than what we might anticipate a button or a joystick. I, and I think somebody um, made the point before about having user testers in place versus getting people to email. There is no way that I could have understood that bodily information about just how light that button, you know, the, um, the intensity of press, what little intensity of press was needed to make, to make that button happen. And then if you're going to try to map that into some sort of game feel mechanic, if you, did, if you didn't know that, it would be a different type of game mechanic. So the actual mechanism for control, for control and how the mechanism feels, whether it's a big switch 
or a gushy sort of switch or a little button that somebody already has are really, really important things for the game that you're making. And this is just an example of what happened during user testing in a typical user testing. So we play the game on a big board and uh, the students take notes and video and document while the user tester is testing. So at the end of year three, I was actually quite delighted. We had a user tester come in successfully um, and the students were actually really happy with what had happened and had done something different than they had ever done before within the, within the curriculum mentioning things like they had the chance to pitch a real product to a real client, that they understood the benefits of a constraint of having to make everything for one button, and that the project was so innovative that it got them attention with game industry people that they wouldn't have got otherwise. So I was pretty happy about that. And then I went and met a, a group of people who had provided us the user, put us in contact with the user tester. And this was a really insane moment for me. So here's this guy who came to user test once. Previous to user testing, his family had sort of written him off. He has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And the life expectancy previously for people with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy was really, was really low. So the government and um, employment agencies and organizations didn't spend a lot of money on supporting people's employment if they had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy because they just sort of said, oh, they're going to die anyways. I mean, I'm putting that really bluntly, so excuse that. So his family, it's not that they'd written him off, but just sort of had overlooked him. And after doing user testing once for like two hours, this is, this is the, the lie of the land, um, his family started to realize, actually, he has something to contribute to our, our family. Um, his niece started asking his advice. And he set up his own game accessibility design consultancy. So when you think about all oh, my accessibility work, I'm just going to make this game accessible. And you think, should I get user testers in to test my game? I am saying, you should get user testers in to test your game. And you should try to pay them, because then they are employed. It is such an easy thing to do, such a win-win. You will get better stuff for your game. The user tester will be way better off because they'll be in some sort of employment. So that was the end of year three. That was a pretty amazing thing to find out about this project. So not only are we changing children's lives in hospices, but we're actually changing people's lives outside of the hospice and in ways that I hadn't anticipated. That brings us to year four. <laughs> I've got two more years to go. No I'm kidding. That brings us to year four. And then I thought, okay, well, if it's cool to have a user tester come in once, why don't I get them in every single week? So they've come in every single week. And this is uh, Ravi. Ravi can move his head about this much. And he can move this finger about this much. And he drives from Birmingham for two and a half hours to test each week. And this is. Oh, sorry, this is, that was Mithin, sorry. And this is Ravi. Um, and Ravi's testing with eye tracking, and then he's doing EEG testing for the game input. So for them, it's, a, it's something in their weekly calendar. Um, Ravi, <laughs> Ravi is now working or doing work, um, I think, at a bank, because he had something he could put on his CV to get a job. The students are getting user testing every week. Um, Mithin has his own game design company, game, sorry, game accessibility um, consultancy, and he's helping other people get into accessibility. But the biggest thing is, it fundamentally changed my students' way of being in the world. So this is an international conference um, with, for Action to Shen. Uh, sorry, for, um, it's, I can't remember what the conference is called, but the, the boys that are in this group here all have Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And my students are running a game design workshop with them. And because they had 
the accessibility knowledge from doing user testing, they could do that. It was a very, very cool thing to, to see, actually. And all of those boys who never would have thought about getting into game development are now thinking about getting into game development. It's kind of a win-win situation. The skills that students learn from projects like these, and they can go and talk at TEDx's den, show off their games. Um, and then I think overall, there's just, in addition to employability for students and employability for user testers, there's just a whole range of impacts, positive impacts of the project. So I just want to summarize these in closing. The first is that for the hospice, the project can improve the quality of life for people with life-threatening disabilities. And the project itself has been recognized because of the development work. Students make games that have a dramatic impact for the better on terminally ill children's lives. In addition, the knowledge they gain is fed back into the development community. It increases the employability of students and user testers and consultants. LifeLights is really, really happy. Um, they're happy with the way that students engage with the project. The success of Enable Gaming helps LifeLights to access funding through, through GamesAid. I don't know if you know what GamesAid is here, but it's a charity um, in the UK that supplies funding for things like special effects and um, lifelines. It is great for us. This year, um, we won the Best Educational Initiative and Talent Development Award at the Taiga Awards. And in closing, that leads uh, to the future. And just one last thing. Students aren't just learning skills. They're, taking a uh, they're getting a phenomenal life experience as am I. Like, I can say my life has completely changed. And I think your life could completely change too, because I'm looking for people to get involved globally in this. So if you are interested, um, you can just drop me an email. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.